Um, obrigado, uh, Edgar. Uh, bom dia para todos. Meu nome é Cital Dillon. Eu sou advogado de Sheffield Hallam University em uh, Inglaterra. Muito uh, obrigado pelo convite, Edgar, uh, para todos o Centro Cultural Justiça Federal. Então, acho que para todos entende, eu tenho muito mal português, então eu vou continuar em inglês. Um, my paper considers the relationship between the need to protect human rights and the duty of its citizens to protect against terrorist attack. In delivering the paper, I do not plan to read it all, but leave you the option to look at it in detail at your leisure. But instead, I intend to highlight the key points by reference to my own experience as working as a human rights lawyer in some 35 countries, uh, including in Brazil. Eu moro em no Rio há mais ou menos quatro anos, em 2004 até 2008. So, eu sou, uh, eu sou carioca e eu sou flamenguista. Ah. Flamenguista? Uh, my, uh, outros países incluem uh, na Índia, África e Afeganistão. The paper is divided into two parts. First, an analysis of what's meant by terrorism, pre and post the events of 9-11. And secondly, and in less detail, Uh, a reminder of the importance of following due process of law in combating terrorism. Um, so the aim of the paper is to provide a brief introduction to the subject and refer to a series of key safeguards which are essential to, clear, to ensure a clear balance ah, between the need to protect human rights whilst countering terrorism. In my experience, human rights and war rarely mix well. In response to the terrorist attacks in September 9-11, uh, President George W. Bush declared a war on terror, which has proven to have serious consequences for the protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms across the world. Given that the tragic events of 9-11 were carried out by Al-Qaeda, the war on terror largely centers on combating Islamic fundamentalism. In other words, the war on terror is in some ways a war on ideology. As a result, civil liberties have restricted, been restricted in numerous countries. Country after country has has enacted prevention of terrorism legislation after 9-11. With, in some cases, the language of terror often used to smear and justify violate, violating the rights of political opponents and marginalized groups. The problems have been exacerbated by Western states particularly the United States, 
and for repression by regimes that are seen as partners in the war on terror. Pakistan, Syria, Libya and Sri Lanka are but a few striking examples. In my view, 9-11 changed everything for the worse. It followed an era of optimism. The promise of the 1990s the end of the Cold War and the enactment of protective human rights legislation at national and international levels. Combined with the outrage of the international community, to the atrocities in Rwanda, former Yugoslavia and East Timor. It led some commentators to wonder at the end of the 1990s whether we were entering a new age of enlightenment. However, the thaw in East-West relations was not yet complete when a new threat of isolationism and biopolarization emerged from the shadows of the disintegrating Twin Towers. Out of these terrible events where 3,000 lives were lost, another evil emerged, the war on terror. As George W. Bush announced, you are either with us or against us. And the world entered a dark era with the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan, the killing of innocent civilians by terrorist cells, the torture of Iraqis in Abu Ghraib prison, all metaphors for the systematic invasion of and erosion of fundamental human rights and civil liberties across the world. However, the problem that this creates is that the enemy remains vague and ill-defined. And the definition of what constitutes terrorism and its relation to the protection and promotion of human rights requires examination. Despite UN and other national and international legal instruments being created prior to and after 9-11, there's still no universal definition of terrorism in international law. In the absence of such a definition, there is no consensus of what construes terrorism. Aside from an agreement, that it involves the threat or the use of violence against innocent people for political means. Not having such a definition leaves it open to misuse and unduly wide application, extending to those who are merely dissent from the social and political norms of society. If you resist an invasion in Cantigalo, or Alemão, are you a terrorist? Hence the practice of limiting human rights in times when it's most imperative to preserve them needs to be revisited. Without such a universal definition, states have created broad, overreaching definitions which unintentionally criminalize activity outside the realm of terrorism. And these broad powers have been used to suppress opposition of unpopular groups under the guise of combating terrorism. Terrorism, in my view, aims at the destruction of human rights through violence and terror employed against civilians 
often by non-state actors, but not always. Terrorists attack democracy. They attack the rule of law and have little respect for humanity. It's important, therefore, that the state, in dealing with such acts of terrorism, operate in a manner which respects the very fundamental freedoms that the terrorists seek to dismantle. The right to life, prohibition against torture, and liberty with, through arbitrary, arbitrary, without arbitrary detention. We need to walk away from racial and ethnic profiling. The, the state has a right to promote due process in law. Freedom of speech, freedom of association, the right to privacy, and many other social, economic, and cultural rights. The importance of protecting such rights cannot be minimized when dealing and developing counter-terrorist measures. Failure to, to comply with such measures may actually result, in my view, in promoting further terrorism. Indeed, the use of discriminatory and stigmatizing measures has affected the rights of entire communities. Therefore, promoting the opportunity for further marginalization and possibly radicalization within those communities. Many of the conditions conducive to the spread of terrorism result from discrimination and disenfranchisement. When states fail to strike this balance between the human rights of their citizens and security in countering terrorism, they do risk impeding the very rights they purport to protect. Indeed, this brings to mind the words of Thomas Paine, who said, several centuries ago, but as pertinent today. He that would make his liberty secure must guard his enemy from oppression, for if he violates this duty, he establishes a precedent that will reach to himself. This does not mean that terrorism is not a very real and present threat. Since 9-11, Madrid 2004, London 2005, Bali 2005, and Boston 2013, terrorism has metamorphosized the global security environment. And states have been forced to redefine the nature of terrorism and to reassess the political, military, and legal means necessary to protect the state. Nevertheless, since 9-11, country after country have decided to look the other way when it comes to fundamental rights and freedoms and the operation of the rule of law the very rights enshrined in the, in, in, the, in the documents produced after the horrors of Nazi Germany. For example, in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. International Covenant on... and the Convention Against Torture and other treaties. In my view, there is no contradiction between effective counter-terrorism and upholding human rights. In fact, um, it is hugely important that we apply the very standards that we are trying to prevent the terrorists from dismantling 
to the terrorists or the alleged terrorists. Hence, the criminal prosecution of terrorist offences is a critical element in preventing counter-terrorism. These concerns become more acute as, as, as states respond to terrorist outrages. My paper goes on to, in some detail, to talk about criminal prosecution of terrorist offences. And I won't go to this in detail now, I'll just cover the main areas. It outlines the steps that need to be taken when investigating, interrogating, and collecting evidence from terrorist suspects. The measures that ought to be taken when people are arrested and detained for suspected terrorist offences. And the importance of fair trial. It also talks about the rights of victims of terrorism. And in conclusion, I argue that these protections are not a luxury that cannot be afforded to those who have alleged or have been proved to have engaged in terrorist attacks. They are a necessity because without them, we are all at the risk of eroding the very freedoms and civil liberties that underpin democracy. You simply cannot trade off respect for human rights and the rule of law against counter-terrorism. Human security itself is the principal human right, the right to life. And the major trade-off is not occurring between a derogation of this right. It is between the rights of the majority of the population and those of minorities. By failing to respect these rights, we are contributing to the process of radicalization. Um, the rest of the paper is there for you to look at. I'm going to finish by illustrating what I've been saying with some examples of places that I've worked in, in different parts of the world. Um, the creation and establishment of Guantanamo Bay, in my view, without due process, without reference to the rule of law, contributed to the increase in terrorist activity when I worked in Afghanistan. I lost 11 people that I worked with and my office was blown to bits. I worked with human beings who were called Afga Afghans. And the, um, the terror that was imposed on those human beings was fueled by the very countries who talk about protecting human rights and then create Guantanamo Bay without reference to that due process. I worked in Rio uh, for four years. And at one point, somebody said to me, more people have died in the city of Rio de Janeiro since the Second World War than the whole of the Israel-Palestinian conflict.
So if we are to demonize whole groups without proper investigation, without due process and the rule of law being applied and a respect for human rights. We simply create the seeds for further radicalization, further criminalization. And nobody has yet convinced me that the reactions to 9-11 and everything that's happened afterwards have led to more stable a more stable global environment. It certainly didn't happen as a result of the invasion of Iraq or the invasion of Afghanistan or the absence of respect for rights in Alemão, Cantogalo or any of the other favelas that we can talk about in Rio de Janeiro and elsewhere. I think an unquestioning stance along with complicity in human rights abuses, is damaging to the international community and it feeds extremism at violence at home and abroad. And it also casts severe doubt on our commitment to democracy and human rights. And as a karaoke, I remember that it was only in one, less than one lifetime that we had military rule in Brazil and how important it is to protect the very rights that were taken away in that dark period. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.